a child and um, in and amongst us. And um, so the sermon today is focused on that. And we've had children participating in worship with us today in many ways. I've chosen the text from Mark 10, 13 through 16, a very familiar passage for all of us concerning children. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me and do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Well, you know, I do remember being a child. It was a long, long time ago in a place far, far away. <laughs> but I remember it. I bet you do too, many of you who are older here today. We remember being children. And those of you who are children, when you get to be my age, you're going to remember being a child. It's a cool thing that we get to remember this. I remember things like going to the movies when I was a child for 25 cents and popcorn was a dime. And um, I remember going to the drugstore next door after the movies and they would make a Coke by squirting syrup on, on uh, crushed ice and then pouring carbonated water and making a fountain drink. How many of you remember those? Yeah, there's a lot of old people here today. <laughs> And I remember bottled Cokes, the little bottle Cokes used to be a nickel. And if you took the bottle back, you got some money in return. And then they went up to six cents and it made us all mad because we had to carry a penny around with us, you know, to get that Coke. I remember building forts in the woods and swinging on monkey vines with my buddies. I remember camping out in the backyard and putting baseball cards on my bicycle spokes with clothespins to make it sound like a muffler. And I thought that was the coolest thing. I remember sleeping in the summertime with my window open and the attic fan would bring the cool air into the house and watching the moon glisten on the grass out in our yard. Something magical about being a kid and just the innocence of it, the joy of it, the anticipation of being a child. And that's a gift to us from God. Eric Byrne constructed a theory of personality in the 1970s and called transactional analysis. And he proposed that within each of us, there are three ego states. One is the parent within us, and we learn this voice from our parents. And so that person, that ego part of us, takes care of things and nurtures things and makes sure things are safe and that things are done correctly. That's our parent. And there's also within us an adult, and that person thinks rationally and makes decisions and takes risk and handles adult-type issues. But Byrne said also within every person there is a child ego state. And that part of us feels emotions and loves and receives love. And so in transactional analysis, there are times when, when the parent in you might be responding to the child in me. This happens in marriages. <laughs> The wife is the parent, the man is the child. That's how that works. And then if the man ever grows up and becomes an adult, the wife really doesn't know what to do anymore. It messes the marriage up. 
Or sometimes we're relating to each other as children, like when a lot of we guys get together and play golf, or some of the ladies get together for tennis. We're playing together, we're children again, we're playing a game, and for a moment at least, we don't have to be adults or parents. We're just children. And we find a lot of joy in our child state. The point is this, there's a child within us that we bring into adulthood. Now, in the first century, in Jesus' world, they didn't believe that. And though most of the parents back then likely valued and loved their children, Judith Gundry Wolf reminds us that, quote, childhood was viewed negatively as a state of immaturity to outgrow. For Jesus to embrace children in this story I've read you this morning is countercultural. Because children had no power, they had no status, until they became adults. And then they were valued people. In fact, this is true, a Roman father had total authority to decide whether his children lived or died. If the child was unwanted, which was in many cases true with female children, the father, not the mother, could decide to put the child out to expose them to the elements, in which case they would either die, which is very, very, very tragic, or they would be picked up by strangers, even more tragic perhaps, and raised for profit as slaves, prostitutes, or beggars. That's what happened in the Roman Empire. So for Jesus to embrace children, and not only to embrace them, but to use them as models of discipleship. Unless you become like one of these, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a big word, never. It was a redefinition of power. He was making a statement that was this. Power is not by domination, it's by receptivity. True power in this world, true power in the kingdom of God is not by human domination. True power is receiving the kingdom of God. It's interesting that Jesus did not point to his 12 disciples and say, Unless you become like one of these, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He didn't point to 12 Jewish adult men and say, you all should be like them. No. In fact, those disciples kept getting in his way. They were forever getting in his way. They sternly forbid the children to come. There were times they cut somebody's ear off you know, who was threatening to Jesus, and Jesus would bend over, pick the ear up, put it back on, and go, I hate it when you do that. <laughs> there were times they were confused about power. They would say, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, thinking he was going to be some kind of real king on earth, we want to sit, this was James and John, we want to sit at your left and at your right. We want to be at places of power when you come into power. And Jesus would say, You've got it all wrong. My kingdom's not going to be like the kingdoms of this world, and you won't sit at my right hand and left hand. The disciples were a nuisance. Why Jesus picked them, I don't really know. He kept working with them, uh, trying to get them up to speed. <laughs> And after he finally left, and you know, he left after three years. My theory is he just couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> and after three years, he zipped off. He didn't walk off. He didn't run off. He flew off. He needed to get away. He's like, I'll see you later. I'll send somebody to take care of you. <laughs> and the poor disciples were like, well, what do we do now? And then they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. They became somebody else. They became more than what they were when the Spirit of God filled their hearts and minds with God himself. But no, Jesus didn't point to 12 grown men and say, look, everybody's got to be like this. 
He pointed to a pack of children who were hugging him and laughing and playing and pulling on each other's hair. And he said, this is what you have to be like in order to come into the kingdom of God. When the disciples forbid the children to come, the Bible says Jesus became indignant. Now that's a big word too, indignant. Interesting word. Why choose that one? Jesus was a little upset. You could have said that. Jesus was annoyed. Jesus was um, in some way dissatisfied or disappointed in his disciples. No, the word is indignant. That's a powerful word. Whatever makes Jesus indignant, we need to find that out and stay away from it like the plague. And he was indignant when society in any way pushed the children to the margins. Our church is a precinct for elections. And on Tuesday, I came to work uh, on election day and I walked in uh, the back door, which is the main door, and there was a little girl sitting by herself on the bench with her um, iPad, waiting for one of her parents, or both of them, I suppose, uh, to vote. And so I stopped and tongue in cheek said, um, good morning, how are you? Good, um, didn't look up. Um, and I said, um, did you vote today? And she said to me something very surprising when she turned and said, I wouldn't vote for Hillary. <laughs> well, I thought, okay, that's not your only option. Um, but I said, uh, so why not? She said, because all she wants is power. Now this little girl's eight or nine years old. So I thought, okay, I'm going to stay in here with this. There's a sermon illustration in here. <laughs> I said, so, um, okay, uh, you're not voting for Hillary. Um, what about Donald Trump? Would you uh, vote for Donald Trump? And she said, no, I hate Donald Trump. <laughs> and I said, well, gosh, uh, okay, uh, why? Do you hate Donald Trump? That's a strong word, hate. She couldn't answer the question. Then it dawned on me. She's parroting what she has heard adults say. She had no idea what all this meant. Hillary only wants power. I hate Donald Trump. Why do you hate some? Well, I couldn't answer. And I thought, are we staining our children with our adult sinfulness? What is it that makes Jesus indignant? To in any way damage or marginalize a child. It's a sad commentary when we adults have adult issues in this culture and yet we handle them in childish ways. And so that our children are growing up with a script and parroting things that they've heard that they don't even understand that have tainted their innocence as children. My guess is Jesus is indignant. I felt sorry for her, and yet I thought, you know, there'll be a day when you'll grow out of this, but I hope you never grow out of the innocence of being a little girl on a bench in a church with an iPad. I hope you'll carry her with you. See, there's something in a child that Jesus values so deeply that he would say, unless you become like that, You'll never enter the kingdom. This is some serious business. 
unless you retain your innocence, unless you find your joy, unless you find the enthusiasm, unless you find that part of you that is still a child, and let that part come to life, you'll never enter the kingdom of God walking in as an adult or a parent. You will receive the kingdom of God as a child of God. Friedrich Schleiermacher was a reformed systematic theologian in the 1800s, considered to be the father of modern theology, and he, he actually preached a sermon on a, a series of sermons on the nature of children, and he noted this, living in communion with Christ in the present without anxiety about past or future is the essence of the eternal life that Christ promises to Christians who believe in him. Here's the point. Adults then must recover this childlike perception as if by conversion. What can a child teach us? Perhaps to live in the present without anxiety in the past or the future. That'd be one thing a child would teach us. Or maybe they would teach us we have the wrong definition of power. That one day Jesus simply opened his arms and received a group of children and gave us a great truth. Real power, true power in life comes from the child within us, the one who knows how to laugh, to love, to cry, to hope, to dream, the one who retains innocence, the one who receives the kingdom of God. Now this last piece is, was of interest to me. Do you know when this story happened? this embracing the children, when in his ministry this story happened. It was his third year of his ministry, his final year. He was on his way to Jerusalem to attend his last Passover before his trial, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. He was so popular, the Bible says, that he couldn't go into towns because he was like a rock star. People came from everywhere to want to touch him in his third year of ministry. They'd heard of him. They wanted to be around him. They wanted to be healed by him. And so this episode happens in that intense movement towards Jerusalem, towards the cross, Jesus stops everything and says, wait a minute, no, 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 bring those kids right there on the front row to me. And I think the disciples in their mind thought, look, man, you're too busy for this. I mean, we're on the way to Jerusalem. We've got a big deal coming. This is an adult world. These kids are kids. They'll outgrow it. You got to stay focused. And Jesus probably said, I am focused. Because unless you become like one of them, you're not getting in. Don't ever lose the child within yourself. The part that knows how to love God. Back. There are a lot of things Jesus said that people didn't remember. And they didn't write down every single thing he said. And there's a lot of things he may have said that we don't have. We don't have him saying anything about homosexuality. We don't have anything. He didn't say anything about war, like that's a bad idea. He never said anything about slavery, like, you know, slavery's bad. He, there's a lot we don't have from Jesus. But of all the things we do have, we have this. They remembered this, and it stuck in their crawl when he said, let the little children come to me, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And unless you become like one of these, you'll never enter it. Oh, they remembered that, and we've never, ever forgotten it. The world would be a different place, wouldn't it, if we transacted with each other as valuing the child within each of us. 
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.